From time to time, people suggest to me that scientists ought to give more considerations to social problems, especially that they should be more responsible in considering the impact of science on society. It seems to be generally, be generally believed that if the scientists would only look at these very difficult social problems and not spend so much time fooling with less vital scientific ones, great success would come of it. It seems to me that we do think about these problems from time to time, but we don't put a full-time effort into them. The reasons being that we know we don't have any magic formula for solving social problems, that social problems are very much harder than scientific ones, and that we usually don't get anywhere when we do think about them. I believe that a scientist looking at non-scientific problems is just as dumb as the next guy, and when he talks about a non-scientific matter, he sounds as naive as anyone untrained in the matter. Since the question of the value of science is not a scientific subject, this talk is dedicated to proving my point, by example. The first way in which science is of value is familiar to everyone. It is that scientific knowledge enables us to do all kinds of things and to make all kinds of things. Of course, if we make good things, it is not only to the credit of science, it is also to the credit of the moral choice which led us to do good work. Scientific knowledge is an enabling power to do either good or bad, but it does not carry instructions on how to use it. Such power has evident value, even though the power may be negated by what one does with it. I learned the way of expressing this common human problem on a trip to Honolulu. In a Buddhist temple there, the man in charge explained a little about the Buddhist religion for tourists, and then ended his talk by telling them that he had something to say to them that they would never forget. And I have now forgotten it. It was a proverb of the Buddhist religion. To every man is given the key to the gates of heaven. The same key opens the gates to hell. What then is the value of the key to heaven? It is true that if we lack clear instructions that enable us to determine which is the gate to heaven and which the gate to hell, the key may be a dangerous object to use. But the key obviously has value. How can we enter heaven without it? Instructions would be of no value without the key. So it is evident that, in spite of the fact that it could produce enormous horror in the world, science is of value because it can produce something. Another value of science is the fun called intellectual enjoyment, which some people get from reading and learning and thinking about it, and which others get from working in it. This is an important point, one which is not considered enough by those who tell us, as it is, a social responsibility to reflect on the impact of science on society. Is, it, is this mere personal enjoyment of value to society as a whole? No but it is also a responsibility to consider the aim of society itself. Is it to arrange matters so that people can enjoy things? If so, then the enjoyment of science is as important as anything else. But I would like not to underestimate the value of the worldview, which is the result of some type of scientific effort. <clears throat> we have been led to imagine all sorts of things infinitely more marvelous than the imaginings of poets and dreamers of the past. It shows that the imagination of nature is far, far greater than the imagination of man. For instance, how much more remarkable is it for us all to be stuck, half of us upside down, by a mysterious attraction to a spinning ball that has been swinging in space for billions of years, than to be carried on the back of an elephant supported on a tortoise swimming in a bottomless sea. I have thought about these things so many times alone that I hope you will excuse me if I remind you of this type of thought that I am sure many of you have had, which no one could ever have had in the past because people then didn't have the information we have about the world today. For instance, I stand at the seashore, alone, and start to think. There are the rushing waves, mountains of molecules, each stupidly minding its own business, trillions apart, yet forming white surf in unison. Ages on ages, before any eyes could see, year after year, thunderously pounding the shore as now. For whom? For what? On a dead planet, 
with no life to entertain. Never at rest, tortured by energy, wasted prodigi prodigiously by the sun. Poured into space, a might makes the sea roar. Deep in the sea, all molecules repeat the patterns of one another, till complex new ones are formed. They make others like themselves, and a new dance starts. Growing in size and complexity, living things, masses of atoms, DNA, protein, dancing a pattern ever more intricate. Out of the cradle, onto dry land, here it is, standing. Atoms with consciousness. Matter with curiosity. Stands at the sea, wonders at wandering. I, the universe of atoms, an atom in the universe. The same thrill, the same awe and mystery, comes again and again when we look at any questions deeply enough. With more knowledge comes a deeper, more wonderful mystery, luring one on to penetrate deeper still. Never concerned that the answer may prove disappointing, with pleasure and con confidence we turn over each new stone to find unimagined strangeness leading on to more wonderful questions and mysteries. Certainly a grand adventure. It is true that few unscientific people have this particular type of religious experience. Our poets do not write about it. Our artists do not try to portray this remarkable thing. I don't know why. Is no one inspired by our present picture of the universe? This value of science remains unsung by singers. You are reduced to hearing not a song or a poem, but an evening lecture about it. This is not yet a scientific age. Perhaps one of the reasons for this silence is that you have to know how to read the music. For instance, the scientific article may say, the radioactive phosphorus content of the cere cerebrum of the rat decreases to one half in a period of two weeks. Now what does that mean? It means that the phosphorus that is in the brain of a rat, and also in mine and yours, is not the same phosphorus that it was two weeks ago. It means the atoms that are in the brain are being replaced. The ones that were there before have gone away. So what is this mind of yours? What are these atoms with consciousness? Last week's potatoes. They now can remember what was going on in my mind a year ago. A mind which has long ago been replaced. To know that a thing that I call my individuality is only a pattern or a dance that is what it means when one discovers how long it takes for the atoms of the brain to be replaced by other atoms. The atoms come into my brain, dance a dance, and then go out. There are always new atoms, but always doing the same dance, remembering what the dance was yesterday. When we read about this in the newspaper, it says, scientists say this discovery may have importance in the search for a cure for cancer. The paper is only interested in the use of the idea, not the idea itself. Hardly anyone can understand the importance of an idea. It is so remarkable. Except that, possibly, some children catch on. And when a child catches on to an idea like that, we have a scientist. It is late for them to get the spirit when they are in our universities. So we must attempt to explain these ideas to children. I would like to turn a third value I would now like to turn to a third value that science has. It is a little less direct, but not much. The scientist has a lot of experience with ignorance and doubt and uncertainty. And this experience is of very great importance, I think. When a scientist doesn't know the answer to a problem, he's ignorant. When he has a hunch to what the result is, he's uncertain. And when he's pretty darn sure of what the result is going to be, he is still in some doubt. We have found it of paramount importance that in order to progress, we must recognize our ignorance and leave room for doubt. Scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty. Some most unsure, some nearly sure, but none absolutely certain. Now, we scientists are used to this, and we take it for granted that it's perfectly consistent to be unsure that it is possible to live and not know. But I don't know whether everyone realizes this is true. Our freedom to doubt was born out of a struggle against authority in the early days of science. 
it was also a very deep and strong struggle. Permit us to question, to doubt, to not be sure. I think that it is important that we do not forget the struggle and thus perhaps lose what we have gained. Herein lies the responsibility to society.